Well, we are live. We are waiting for people to join us. Hopefully we will have uh, quite a few. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing well. I am excited about this uh, opportunity for us to have a conversation. I'm really excited about this. For those of you who do not know, this is Dr. Lee Johnson and I am Dr. Jill Wagner. We are trying to let a few more people come in, uh, but if they are not here during the conversation, the hope is, well, we're a little early. So people, <laughs> so we caught some of you off guard by being a little bit early. So we won't get into a lot of conversation for a few more, four minutes, but let me tell you why, why we are here today. Dr. Johnson and I are here to talk about the Black Alzheimer's Brain Study. Did I get that correct, Dr. Johnson? Perfect. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff, but it, it's important to know. So many of you, uh, as I told you that we were going to be doing this live conversation, I got a lot of uh, comments and a lot of people who told me, oh my goodness, I really want to talk about this. Alzheimer's has impacted so many of us. There are very few people that I know of who have not been impacted in some way. So uh, this is a conversation that I think is important for us to have. Um, the Black Alzheimer's Brain Study is actually looking for people to participate in that study. And you all know, just like I know, in our community, whenever you say study, we immediately start having concerns about uh, that because of our history and our history in health care. <laughs> Um, we all know about the Tuskegee study. We all know about Gila and Henrietta Lacks. Uh, we know about uh, things like a sterilization of women who did not want to be. So those things are uh, still with us in terms of our memory and our trauma. So we are here to talk about the Black Alzheimer's Brain Study, not only to talk about the study itself, uh, but also to give you all an opportunity to ask us questions, because if you have questions, we want to be able to answer those for you. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Johnson is just like me. I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. And uh, if I don't have the answer, I'll say, I don't know, but we can try to find out for you or direct you to someplace else. I do want to tell you that this is the first of a three-part series. I'm excited about that. So we're going to be talking about this this Sunday and the next two Sundays to come. Um, and uh, if you don't get the information that you need today or there's somebody else that you think will benefit from hearing this conversation, make sure you hit like and share and, and pass that information on to them. So Dr. Johnson, we are going to start with... You just, if you would, please just tell people who you are and what you do and uh, your, um, your role in the study. Absolutely. I'm Lee Johnson. I'm a professor at UNTHSC, and I am the Associate Director of the Institute for Translational Research. I'm one of the leads of the Black Alzheimer's Brain Study, which is part of our larger Health and Aging Brain Study. And... Um, my job is to help tell people about the study and get people engaged in research. And we have been at UNT for 10 years in this community. So we're really excited to bring this study to you. That, that's good stuff. So how, how, how did you all, um, why this study? Why, why this particular study? And who all is involved in the whole, the overall study? Well, this study was extremely important. For 10 years, we have been studying the different racial and ethnic differences in Alzheimer's disease in terms of pres presentation as well as prevalence. And older Black Americans are 
twice as likely than older white Americans to develop Alzheimer's disease. Yet less than 5% are enrolled in research to study this disease. And it's really, really important for us to be able to bring this study to this community so we can find out why the prevalence is so high in this community. I think that's really important because so many of us are not aware that there are that that Alzheimer's is is not something that just falls out of the air. In other words, we are not aware that there are many, many things that contribute to this disease. Some of them we kind of have an understanding of, but many of them we do not. I often tell people that the causes of Alzheimer's, it's like having uh, 50 holes in your roof. And if you block up one, it's still raining. If you block up two, it's still raining. But if you impact most of them, you are able to stop the rain with Alzheimer's being the rain. So us understanding what all of those contributing factors are is absolutely crucial for being able to understand this devastating disease. Uh, we were talking, um, some of you know, some of you don't, but we were talking before we came on live about the fact that my grandmother had had dementia. And I think so many of us have, have lived with somebody who has Alzheimer's. If you have not lived with Alzheimer's, uh, the true impact of this disease, even as a physician, uh, for years, my grandmother, uh, I called her every morning on my way to work. And for years, I'd say, Mama, what are you doing? And she's saying, I'm, I'm doing my bills. And I kept thinking, you only have four or five. Why, why are, you, are you doing this every morning? Well, it wasn't until she moved into our home that I realized what the issue was. As I was packing her things to leave, to come to our home, I found all of these checkbooks where she would start a check and she did not remember how to write a check. And so part of what was happening to her is that she didn't know how to write a check. She didn't know how to hang clothes on hangers anymore. I mean, there were just all of these things. And I was a physician and did not recognize this. So I think having any information that we can and just having the conversation so we are able to say to people, when you see something different in those that you love, it could be dementia. Let, let's think about that. Let's not wait until it's in its final stages. Let's, let's think about this early on so we can make preparations and keep them safe and get them as much help as possible. So I thank you guys for doing the study. Well, and you said so many important things in that, that Alzheimer's is a disease is the result of so many things. It's typically right. not the result of one thing. It's right. a combination of a person's unique genetic, biological, environmental, and lifestyle factors, um, your health risk factors, and all of these things contribute to our risk for Alzheimer's disease. But you're so right. And the changes in the brain, what we know with Alzheimer's disease is the changes in the brain happen 10 to 20 years, a lot of times before symptoms develop. So mm -hmm. it's, it's small incremental changes that are happening in our brain. And then, like you said, the family members are like, how did I not see this? Right. But the changes have happened so slowly and over time that right. that's, it, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of shocking once you realize it as a family member. I know. I I uh, know one of my friends. Uh, her uh, parent was. He was getting pretty. Um, he was having some real cognitive issues, and they kept saying, "Well, he has a little bit of Alzheimer's," <laughs> and he could he couldn't remember how to get to the barber shop that you know he had gone to for you know decades. And so I think that we have to understand that, that it's, it's just important for us to know this. And this information is just so good. One of the things, though, that I think is great about this study, and we'll, we'll keep talking about this, is that you all will actually, well, first of all, tell us what the study is. What information do you need from people uh, that will participate in the study? 
Sure. So this study involves several visits. The yeah. first visit is an interview that it will ask you questions about your life and your health. Then you do a series of memory testing. Also, we'll do a blood draw. And then you'll do an MRI scan and PET scans, which the PET scans are very important because that's how we tell if you're developing plaques and tangles, amyloid and tau in the brain. So those are all very important. Um, and so it takes several visits and you, you complete these visits. And then at the end, you can elect to have the results sent back to you or sent back to your doctor if you choose. I think that's real important because um, the information that you all gather, the participants can get that information and take it to their healthcare provider. So while you're gathering data, you're not treating anything, you're gathering data, but they can take that information back. So if there's something that looks abnormal or you know, it may be something in the blood work that we need to do something with, I think that's really, really important. So the participants have access to some screenings like a PET scan and, um, uh, and a brain scan that they may not have access to otherwise. I think that that's really a big thing and real important that they will be able well, to get the data. You have a baseline. So yes. whether or not mm -hmm. you're completely healthy, at least we know that. Um, but like you said, then it's not after the fact when you forget how to write a check that we can tell there was a change that happened. Right. And so it's really important, even, even if you don't feel like you have any memory concerns to still have that baseline. Right. Yeah. That's good stuff. And we've learned that from, from things like mammograms, you know, one of the reasons Absolutely. that we do, we start screening mammograms earlier is because now we know if you've got a baseline that's healthy, now when there's something going wrong or something different in that tissue, now we have something to compare to. So having the opportunity to have a baseline brain scan, that I think that's, that's that pretty That is neat. pretty neat. Yeah. Well, and we also want to study healthy aging along with unhealthy aging, because that's really important in terms of prevention. So in our study right now, you just have to be 50 years or older and that's part and, and be able to safely undergo the procedures, of course, the scans, but right. that's really important for us to study this disease younger and younger, because what we're finding is that's when we think we can intervene. It's the stuff that happens in midlife that is really impacting us later in life. Right. I, that's important that you said healthy aging because there are some people that believe that uh, Alzheimer's and that severe cognitive decline is part of aging. So in my community, my uncles used to call Alzheimer's old timers because they thought that it just was by virtue of aging that this happened to your brain. Tell us about that. It, that's not healthy aging. No, it's not. Now your risk for Alzheimer's disease, of course, increases as you age. Right. Um, but it is not a disease. It is not part of normal aging. It is a progressive, irreversible brain disorder that impacts your memory and thinking and slowly your ability to do daily activities right. such as dress yourself and feed yourself. So it's not normal aging. There is slow slowing of your reaction speed. That's normal, mm -hmm. normal forgetfulness. Those things are normal, but this is really very different than the normal forgetness, forgetfulness that occurs as you age. So forgetting where you put your keys, normal aging. Putting your keys in the refrigerator, not normal. No, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So, and so, what we tend to see with Alzheimer's patients is it starts with the most recent memories and then works its way back. Mm -hmm. So we tend to stage this disease with, can you remember your most recent grandbaby? Or your most, can you remember their name? Because what we tend to find is Alzheimer's patients, their memory for the past is really, really good. Mm -hmm. But it starts with their memory of what's currently happening right now. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons that sometimes family members don't understand what's going on. So, you know, mom or dad is repeating the same question over and over, but they can remember something that happened 50 years ago. Absolutely. And so they don't understand. It's like, I've had patients say to me or loved ones of patients say to me, well, mama remembers what she wants to remember as yeah. though they're, you know, they really think it's like, well, yeah. they are, they have selective memory because they choose to, but the reality is it's those short term things that they can't lay down new memories when often the old memories are intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a, a, a real big thing. And I think that's real important for us to know. So talk to us a little bit about the causes of Alzheimer's that we know and understand. So the ones that we can do something about and the ones that we can't, if you'll kind of go through that for us. Sure. So there is there are genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and we tend to find these among family members. So, of course, having two parents that have developed Alzheimer's disease increases your risk. So there is a family risk and a genetic risk. And those would be the things that you might not be able to do anything about. Right. Now, there are other risk factors like health risk factors, such as cardiovascular disease. That's a big big risk factor for development of Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, things like uncontrolled depression and anxiety. Um, there are stress and environmental factors that contribute to Alzheimer's disease as well. And things, there are certain things that are protective against Alzheimer's disease, like continued education throughout your life, keeping your brain active, uh, staying healthy. Those things are considered protective against Alzheimer's disease. And those are things that we can do something about. You know, you can't, uh, well, there's a whole uh, area of study now, epigenetics, as you're aware of, where we're kind of looking at the impact of our lives and the things that happen to us and how genes are expressed. But for the most part, your genes are what they are. Uh, so you can't change those. Um, you can't change your gender. You can't change, you know, you may look really good while you age, but you're still aging. So you can't, because we would back that up if we can't, but we can't. Um, so aging is what aging is, but things like uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, those are things that have to do with lifestyle, many of them. So that's where I think we come in. Our conversation is so important because so many people don't really understand that what you do can also impact this. I think this week we're kind of going to focus on high blood pressure. Um, there are many people who have high blood pressure. We know a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. There have been some indicators that the older you get, it can be a little bit higher, but still 120 over 80. So I've encountered patients sometimes that blood pressure may be running 160 over 95 or 170 over, you know, 95. And it's done that for years. And they will say to me, Dr. Wagner, my blood pressure is always high. So that is just normal for me. I think it's important for us to say to people that normal is normal. And there is not, <laughs> it's not normal for some people and abnormal for 170 over anything is abnormal. I don't care if it's been abnormal for 10 years or 10 days, that's abnormal. And you want to do something about it because if the blood pressure continues to be elevated, then that damages blood vessels. And right. if those blood vessels are damaged and you don't get adequate flow to the brain or nourishing flow to the brain, then that increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's or other dementias, but Alzheimer's also. Absolutely. We know that uncontrolled blood pressure, especially in midlife, is related to cognitive decline. And particularly among African Americans, we tend to see that they have a younger age of onset of yes. high blood pressure. Yes. 
and greater severity. And so these things are all contributing to potential risk of developing Alzheimer's disease later in life. Right. Uh, I was looking at just the numbers, you know, the, what does the Center for Disease Control say about blood pressure in African Americans? And it literally says that uh, 54% of African American uh, adults have uh, high blood pressure. And when you get past about the age of 60 or 65, those numbers go up into the 70s. So we're talking about 72, 73% of folk who have elevated blood pressure or high blood pressure, some treated, some not. So it's really important for people working on blood pressure to try to get that under control. Well, and we know that um, elevated blood pressure through life increases um, inflammation and oxidative stress and potential for stroke and vascular injury. And all of these things are related to your brain. And we tend to say healthy heart, healthy brain. If it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain, just like exercise, diet, all of these other lifestyle factors that we talk about being healthy for our heart. It's the same for our brain. I think that's real important. Healthy heart, healthy brain. So uh, the other thing is we have so isolated medicine. And so we talk about the heart like that's different than like it lives someplace else other than the place that your brain lives. But it's important to know that it's a closed system and Mm -hmm. and everything affects everything else. And so if you are struggling to keep your blood pressure down, that can not only affect your brain, but can affect your kidneys. And that also can affect your brain. I mean, it just goes on and on. So I think those are are good things for us to tell people. So there are a couple of things that I want to tell people in specifically about how to keep that blood pressure down. Uh, There are a few things that are really, really simple. Uh, One is medication. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it's important lifestyle is very good. I mean, you know, you always want to start with lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes means diet, exercise, Mm -hmm. controlling stress. But until those things kick in, if it requires medication to get that blood pressure down, that is important. I was looking at a study that was published um, uh, from Johns Hopkins. And Uh, It was published in the Journal of Neurology, and they found that doing the potassium sparing diuretics, uh, Mm -hmm. which are just, you know, diuretics, a lot of people Mm -hmm. use those, that decreased the risk of developing, and it was a study where, you know, where they look and uh, uh, correlate things. But those people who were able to keep their blood pressure down and, and did a, a diuretic that they're, they had lower rates of, of dementia. So I, Absolutely. I, yeah, I think that's important to know that when you are looking at the information, you are gathering new information and also verifying information that we have already to see if this in fact is is the the case. And for a lot of African-Americans in my practice, uh, I know a lot of African-Americans doing a a diuretic often helps them. So medication is important. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just a little bit of weight loss. I mean, it doesn't have to be a whole Mm -hmm. bunch of weight loss, uh, but just as, as little as 11 or 12 pounds can impact blood pressure for a lot of people, just like it impacts diabetes. Um, exercise lowers your blood pressure, uh, helps you to control your stress. Um, all of that is, is really good. And then one thing that I think is important for people to take your blood pressure, measure your blood pressure. You do not know what it is doing unless you keep a measurement of it. Well, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because these are all the things we say when people ask us how to prevent Alzheimer's disease is good diet, exercise, controlling your medical conditions, such as blood pressure, diabetes, things like that, Um, getting sleep. um, All all of these things are connected. And this is how we tell when everybody asks us, how do we prevent it? 
what are the things we can do? That's exactly the same thing. But I think, um, you know, you said something really important is sometimes medication is necessary because things like diet changes and exercise, they take longer to work. Yes. And um, really what the research tend to show is it's, it's not that you have high blood pressure, it's uncontrolled high blood pressure. Yes. Um, if you can control it, whether it's through medication or a combination of medication, diet, exercise, all of the above, yes. that's what we're really seeing is protective. Right. And that's important because a lot of people don't want to start medication. I often have patients say, well, I've heard once I started, I'm on it forever. And I have seen people come off blood pressure medications with lifestyle change and when they really you know buckle down and they lose weight or they uh you know their life gets less stressful sometimes when people retire they don't need their <laughs> blood pressure medicine anymore so maybe retire. it's funny how that happens <laughs> it's funny how that happens uh, uh all of those things but i think that it's important to understand that it is a combination of the things that we have available and access to that can really help uh, to keep your brain healthy. So that so that's right. that's real, really good stuff. Are we getting any questions, Jillian? You don't have any questions yet, but Jillian has a question. Yes, we have a question <laughs> from Jillian, who's in, those of you who know, you know, Jillian is our back, she's our producer. So she's in the background. Yes, question. So if you come off of your blood pressure medicine and then your blood pressure has declined and then it goes back up again. Right. Do you have to start your blood pressure medicine? Yes, you do. Again? So her question was, if you were on blood pressure medicine, your blood pressure got, you know, really good and your doctor took you off of it and then your blood pressure went back up, do you need your medicine? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You want to keep that blood pressure under control. Uh, the way you're able to come off blood pressure medicines many times is because you've done all of those things and, and they really kicked in over the course of time. And the way I tell if somebody can come off blood pressure medicine, if 120 over 80 is normal and your blood pressure is dropping to 70 over something, it's time to, to decrease that dose and maybe come off the blood pressure medicine. But just getting down to normal on your blood pressure medicine does not mean it's time to come off. That's number one. Number two is you never want to stop your medicine without talking to your healthcare provider. And as you know, anything that we're talking about today, I forgot to say that at the beginning, this is not medical advice. This is uh, information for you. So we are not treating you in any way. Um, but this is information so that you can work with your healthcare provider and uh, make good decisions, informed decisions as you try to make sure that you are well. But yes, uh, before you stop your medicines, you always want to talk to your healthcare provider so they can guide you through that, um, through that process. All righty. What other things do we have? Is there anything else? that you think that we ought to talk about that that's important uh, to you. Um, we talked about whether Alzheimer's is a normal age. I have a question for you. Oh, so what Mike, got a question. Does, what factors do eggs and shellfish have on high blood pressure and cholesterol? Somebody asked about shellfish and eggs on high cholesterol. Uh, I see, and you know, that information has gone back and forth. Uh, this is the thing. Uh, all cholesterol that you get from your diet comes from animal products. There is no cholesterol in plant products. So if cholesterol is a problem for you, you want to stay away from those things that are high in cholesterol. We also know that the rest of your diet is important and the rest of your lifestyle is important. We know that exercise is important. Uh, we know that uh, eating lots of plants is important for controlling your cholesterol. There are a few people who have severely elevated cholesterol because of a genetic propensity for that. If you are one of those people, you probably need medication. How early have you seen dementia occur in patients? How early have you seen dementia occur? You talk to us a little bit about that and then I'll talk from a clinical perspective, the earliest I've seen. So, 
In terms of dementia, there is an early onset dementia. And that tends to be very, very um, based in genetics. So we tend to find that that early onset dementia, it happens in the 40s and the 50s, but it is very much within families. There is very much specific genetics that cause that to occur. In late life, we tend to see MCI, what we call that stage in between Alzheimer's and normal aging, where you we call it mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And we tend to see that that can start anywhere from the 50s and the 60s. Um, but the real risk for Alzheimer's disease at 65 and above, it increases every year over 65. So we can see it as young as the 60s. I've seen um, a few patients uh, in my clinical career who uh, started having symptoms of dementia and both were women who developed severe dementia, Alzheimer's uh, in their 50s. So by the time they were 55, they were pretty much at end stage dementia, but it, it was uh, genetic. Uh, family, uh, they had had it in, in their families. And it presented really differently in both of those women. It, pre it presented as this severe depression. There was wow. just absolutely a severe depression and uh, could not figure out what it was and how to do it. It took several years and scans and specialists before they got the diagnosis but I have seen it in women and in, in, in some women that were in as young as their 50s. Mm -hmm. And certainly female gender is uh, related to increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. And there are many theories as to why that is, um, but we definitely see that. I was gonna ask you, did you know if there were any specific things that we knew already that, was, that, that, that contributed to that? So, so we do know that things like there are reproductive factors that increase women's risk for Alzheimer's disease. Of course, women also live longer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another, since age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and women live longer, we do tend to see um, higher rates of Alzheimer's disease in women. Uh, women, certain genetics. So if you're APOE3-4 mm -hmm. positive, Mm -hmm. you tend to progress faster, particularly women who are APOE3-4 positive tend to mm -hmm. progress faster than men. Um, so, you know, things like having hysterectomy, hormones, mm -hmm. um, things like that tend to increase women's risk as well. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about APOE4. Sure. So the most common risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is APOE4. So you have two of them. You can, um, and we tend to say if you have 4-4 four, four, or 3-4, your risk is increased. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a small percentage of risk. It's less than 20%. Mm -hmm. So it's not a huge risk, ri genetic risk like other conditions. I mean, if you think about breast cancer risk, it is double that if you okay. have um, one of the breast the cancer genes. Mm -hmm. um, but it does- for, I'm sorry, that's a gene, yes. guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. So if you have three, four or four, four, you're at increased, more increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so we tend to find that women who are three, four positive, tend to progress faster when they develop Alzheimer's disease too. So, um, you know, it is a small part of the risk picture. I mean, like I said, it's less than 20%, three, four is about 10% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So it's not a, the only part of the puzzle, but it does increase your risk. That plus having a family member who's developed Alzheimer's disease. And if you have the APOE4 gene, it does not mean that 100% you will have Alzheimer's. No, I, I'm APOE3-4 positive. So um, that doesn't mean that I'm going to develop Alzheimer's disease. What I tell people is I kind of think of my risk for Alzheimer's disease as being a complete picture. And so my risk profile, my genetic risk is a little higher. So 
Maybe that means I get in the gym a little more, <laughs> um, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors that contribute to your overall risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And if you do have a higher genetic risk, then, you know, trying to control those lifestyle factors is more important. The reason I asked that question uh, is because now people can go and get their, you know, they can get their genes. So, you know, you can do yes. some of the things, you know, you see them on TV and they can tell you about risk and people get those, get that information back and now they are devastated. So I think it's important yes. to say just because you have the gene does not guarantee you are going to have dementia. You just now, it's some more, or doesn't mean you're gonna have Alzheimer's. It's more information for you to put in your database. And so now you know, I have more risk of that. These are the things that I know can help me with that, mitigate that risk. Let me see if I can do some of these other things a little bit more. Like you said, go to the gym a little more often. Make sure you eat as healthy as possible. Make sure you manage your stress so that even though you have the gene, you can do everything you can to take care of some of those other risk factors so that you can stay well. Well, and I always caution people to be very be cautious about some of the online genetics thing right. because sometimes you don't know what genes they're looking at. Right. And so they may say you have a risk for Alzheimer's disease, but they may not have even looked at three yeah. at, at APOE4. Right. Um, but also it's what you do with that information. And it can be very scary to get right. those results back and feel like you have no control right. over um, uh, over your what's going to happen to you if you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. And, and I always try to caution people about the genetics, with the exception of early onset, is such a small piece of the puzzle. Um, and really, it is, it is a lot lower of a risk factor than just age alone and gender and these health conditions that you can control. I think that is just great news because so many people who have family members that they have watched uh, grapple with, with Alzheimer's are scared to death. They are just scared that because I have seen my family member have this, I it's coming. So I think that's good news that it that's it ain't necessarily so, that it's not necessarily going to happen. Also, good news to know that we are really trying to, to delve into some of those other causes and reasons. And that's yet another reason to be involved in the study so that we can gather as much information as we can. Absolutely. And, you know, it is research is at the heart of all our medical advances. Yes. And what we have learned so far is that prevalence rates, risk factors are different based on things like gender and ethnicity. Yeah. And so it's very important if we're going to design treatments that yeah. are going to help all of our communities, that we study all of our communities and understand their unique risk factors. And as a physician, you know that there are certain treatment modalities you can't use based on race for things like cancer and stuff like that. So it's very important for us to understand how this disease impacts everyone based on their unique factors, rather than just studying only one group and trying to apply their treatments for that one group to everyone. Right. And, and that's really important because we are, I know as a clinician, one of the, the reason that a lot of my patients will come to me is because they want somebody who's sensitive to the health issues that are specific to them. And um, so they will say, I need somebody to even something as simple as a dermatologist who understands brown mm -hmm. skin. Absolutely. And so it's really important that all of the information that we get, that everybody participates in these studies. So like you say, we will have treatment modalities and we can have information so that we will be able to treat people appropriately. 
that that's good. You got another question? Yes, I have several. Okay, we have several questions. <laughs> the first question is, I had an MRI. It discovered that I had two narrow vessels in the brain at 68. Should I be concerned? I think that's something that, so I've had people who had narrowed blood vessels to the brain that was genetic. And I also have people who had narrowing secondary to cardiovascular disease or to vascular disease. So it depends on what the cause is. I think you should work very well uh, closely with your physician uh, to determine the cause. If it is something uh, like, you know, elevated blood pressure or plaque formation or some of that, that you should uh, seek the appropriate treatment so that you can stop the progression if that is possible. Having that information is an advantage. Should you be worried? No. Should you be concerned? Yes. So having concern means you do everything that you can to be as well as you can for as long as you can, but worrying will not fix it. That's wonderful advice. <laughs> you like that? I like that a lot. <laughs> is there a brain supplement that you recommend? Is there a brain supplement that this is always the question. And there is not one brain supplement. And there are so many things, particularly in the media, we see that all the time. If you take this, then all of a sudden you will be better. Um, I, 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 I kind of chuckle because when my grandmother's, uh, she thought that, you know, she was ha having some memory stuff. So she got some supplements and I said, mama, are you taking them? Uh, are they helping? She said, well, baby, if I can remember, <laughs> remember to take them. So, so she really could not remember to take them. But there is not one supplement mm -hmm. that works for the brain. Now, it, maybe some information is going to come in the future that will Maybe, but that. as of now, there's no one thing that, or no one supplement that has been shown to um, increase or improve brain function. I mean, and generally it's just overall health. Right. Right. So, you know, anything that improves your overall health, again, like we said earlier, if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. If it's good for your overall wellness and health, it is good for the brain. Is there an application for this study? Yes, here, this is a great study, great question. Whoever that was, thank you so much for that lead in. So the question was, is there an application for the study? And I'm going to take that a little further and say, how do you apply? And how long is the study? Sure. So like I said, the study takes place over a couple of visits. So um, they can be anywhere up to an hour, hour and a half. The scan may take a little longer just because you have to change and, you know, put on some scrubs and things like that. Um, but it generally takes place over three or four visits. Um, and the scans can take up to an hour, you know, depending on time and stuff like that. So um, overall, most people are done within four to five hours over a couple of visits. Um, so, and then we ask you to come back 24 months later and do sense. everything again. So we okay. can see if there's been a change over time. And again, okay. you get the results back from both visits. Okay. So they come back um, 24 so months. So how to join? Let, oh, I'm sorry. How many months? 24 they, months. So 20 two months. years. So two years. So it's a two year commitment. Okay, yes. So to sign up, you can go to the black ALZ brain study .com, or you can call 817-735-2963. And you, they will ask you some screening questions, give you more information about the study. So of course, if you have any questions or um, any concerns, you can ask the front desk staff and then they will make sure that you know, you are able to undergo the study and do the scans. Um, some people have metal in their body or something that make make undergoing an MRI unsafe. So, you know, of course that, that may exclude you from being in the study, but then they will try to get you scheduled. Do you, um, 
can they bring somebody with them or uh and where will it be it's in fort worth it's at the it's at UNTHSC at the Health Science Center in Fort Worth, and everything is on our campus. So you'll be able to do the scans at the Imaging Center on our campus, and we have pictures and maps on the website. Um, but yes, you can bring someone with you. Now, we won't let someone give you the answers to the memory test during the <laughs> visits, but you can, of course, bring, we have people bring family members all the time, particularly if you have someone who, you are concerned has memory problems you can have a family member or spouse with you that was the next question do you just want people who have no memory problems uh, if somebody has memory issues like mind mild cognitive issues uh can they participate what about somebody who has not been diagnosed with alzheimer's but their family thinks they might have it what where where tell tell us about who so 50 and above and we are looking for like we said we want to study healthy and unhealthy aging so anyone who who's able to do the study can be in it if you're 50 and older so whether or not you have a, a concern if you're worried about your um, memory or if you think you're perfectly healthy we we want you to participate in the study you want everybody mm -hmm. you'll take all com comers if all they comers, can, yes. if they can do uh the things that they need to do in order mm -hmm. to participate and answer the and questions. 50 and above now we are applying yeah. for a grant to actually lower that age range oh, wow. because we think it's so important to understand these early life factors but we haven't got it yet so what about people who've had some brain injury before you accept uh, would they be candidates so say somebody who's had a, a stroke or you know a history of tias or any of those kinds of things would that exclude them from the study so um as long as so I hate to say that anything will exclude you now as long as you're able to still do the test and um functions and you know tias people get told they have tias all the time and they're not um, really TIAs. and so yeah. you know we're always very cautious about that yeah. um but the front desk staff they will screen you and make sure that you don't have anything that would make it unsafe for you to be in the study so if for those of you who don't know a tia is a transient ischemic attack mm -hmm. uh in some um circles, they're known as mini strokes. People say there are mini strokes. Uh, and it'll be where somebody had an episode where they either passed out or had some weakness or something, and they couldn't, didn't see anything. And they said it was probably a TIA or something that was transient that cleared up. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Question about six more. Six I lost more. Both my grandmother yeah. Alzheimer's. Uh -huh. Am I in the high risk category for Alzheimer's? She's uh, missed the first part. She said she lost both of her grandmothers. So I'm assuming maternal and paternal grandmothers to Alzheimer's. And she was wondering, did that increase her risk? So there is a risk associated with a family risk. So that does increase your risk. But really, we're looking at your your parents. You know, what was your parents' um, risk for Alzheimer's disease or did they develop Alzheimer's disease? Um, so there is fam familial risk is a part of the bigger picture. But again, it does not mean you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. Okay. The next Good. question is, can lack of sleep or depression cause dementia and, all, and or Alzheimer's? Can lack of sleep or depression, you heard that one. Both of those are do are considered risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Absolutely. Um, depression is considered a, a very big risk factor for developing right. Alzheimer's disease. So just like um, heart conditions and diabetes, your mental health is important to take care of and manage throughout your life. And sleep is a huge piece of the puzzle as well. Right. I think that... Uh, we have, I have to say to people, or we have to say to people, if you are having issues sleeping, go and see your healthcare provider about that. Mm -hmm. uh, often I call these, oh, by the way, things that you'll go in for your regular yes. stuff. And just as the doctor starts to go out the door, you say, 
oh, by the way, I can't sleep. That should have been your first, you should have made an appointment for that. I am not sleeping. And so, you know, we can go through why, what's going on at night. You are not sleeping because your brain won't shut off. You are not sleeping because you're waking up having palpitations. You are not sleeping because you can't breathe. You are not sleeping mm -hmm. because you're getting up, going to the bathroom. You are not sleeping because your back is hurting or your shoulders. You are not sleeping because your hands are going numb. You are not sleeping. There are so many things that, that could contribute to that. I think if you are not able to sleep or you're going to sleep and waking up or you if it's disrupted sleep it is very important to make an appointment and go to talk to your physician specifically about your inability to sleep because sleep is critical your brain does a lot of things during sleep mm -hmm. and repair itself is one of them and throw and out it can be uh an indication of so many underlining health conditions. Yes, yes. So sleep is very important and you should talk to your physician about the fact that you can't sleep. And we actually have a, a sub-study going on in our, our group right now that is solely focused on sleep wow. and waking up in the middle of the night and you get a sleep report that tells you how your sleep was during the night. Mine was horrible. <laughs> I will tell you that now. I was a little shocked, um, but it tells you how long you're staying in REM sleep and all of these things and how you're breathing during the night are so important to your overall risk profile. Yeah, that, that, that's really important. And a lot, I find that a lot of people, particularly women who go through menopause, sleep becomes an issue. A huge issue. It becomes an issue. They are not sleeping. So sleep is really important. Yes. I've heard that estrogen levels can affect your risk levels for Alzheimer's. She said she's heard that estrogen levels can affect your risk for Alzheimer's. So um, estrogen and menopause um, so hormones are related to Alzheimer's disease and, um, but it's really, are you, it, it's really after the fact and how you're controlling your estrogen and your progesterone as you're going through menopause and those later stages. And we tend to see that, you know, women that have, you know, there is a link between hormone replacement therapy. And like I said, having a hysterectomy and a, um, having your ovaries removed, those things are also related to increased risk. So hormones are an overall part of the picture of just general health for women. And so that is definitely something to be talking with your doctor about as you age. Yeah, and, it, it, and the reason for your, um, for your menopause. So you can have menopause that's just like normal menopause. You know, you've reached that age but there are women who have their ovaries removed. Well, when your ovaries are removed, if you are 20 and your ovaries right. are removed, you are then menopausal instantly because your ovaries are gone. And so a younger brain is not going to have all of those years of estrogen. So again, that's which is what, protective, right? Which is protective, right? Your brain. So that's one of the things that you really want to talk to your doctor about so that you can work through that. One of the things that used to happen when um, women were sterilized in the 60s, uh, particularly women of color, their ovaries and uterus would be removed and they would not be put on any, any hormone replacement. And so I saw in my, some of the patients I've taken care of, those who had those early hysterectomies, and this was not a study, this is just observational. Those who had those early hysterectomies and nothing did not do well cognitively. Uh, and uh, those Absolutely. who still had their ovaries until they were 50 uh, did much better cognitively. Absolutely. Three more questions. Yes. The first mm -hmm. is, do water pills dehydrate your kidneys 
when you need them for your high blood pressure? And does it work to help your high blood pressure? So you don't dehydrate your kidneys. Uh, what uh, water pills do or diuretics do for blood pressure is they help you to excrete more water. So they lower the, the, the overall pressure on those blood vessels. So yes, you can get dehydrated if you don't hydrate properly and you don't do the rest of the stuff that you should do. That is an issue, but your kidneys just by themselves don't get dehydrated. Your body is dehydrated. For the study, is there an open MRI for those who may be on the larger side or claustrophobic uh, or any of that? It is an open MRI. Now it still, it still has a... Um, sort of, I call it a ring around it, um, but it is open. Yes, absolutely. Okay. But if you're claustrophobic, it, it it can be a tough experience, an MRI in general. So it's very important to talk with the staff and let them know, um, let them know if you are. So is there any, um, if they worked with their doctor, if their, could their doctor, if somebody were uh, claustrophobic, if their doctor gave them a little sedative, is that possible? Or is we that have had that in the past, and I mean, okay. it's it's just important that it's it's something that their doctor has right them. has given them. Yeah, so they could work with their physician on yeah. that. It's a good question. So this is the final question, and then we will wrap up. Uh, my dad died from colon cancer and started developing Alzheimer's during the later part of his death. Does that put me in a higher risk? And what are some things I can do to combat to combat that risk? Well, we've kind of talked. You 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 go there too. We've kind of talked about some of those risks, those things that you can do that we know now. There are many more that we don't fully understand. Uh, it, it's difficult to answer that question because if it was cancer and he had metastatic cancer and he had metastasis to his brain, we don't know whether that was Alzheimer's or that the cognitive change that you saw was related to either treatment or metastasis to the brain. So that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a complex question to answer. Um, your thoughts. That was the perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so absolutely. You're absolutely right. That one's very, very difficult. Um, especially if he was on, uh, chemotherapy medication, right. radi radiation, radiation, you know, there's a whole host of factors that could have impacted that diagnosis. Absolutely. Okay. okay. This is the last one. She okay. <laughs> I promise. Considering these steps for patients, at what age do physicians begin discussing Alzheimer's? Mm. Well, I know mm. in, in our, um, when you start to get Medicare age, there is a questionnaire that we ask all kinds of things and we do the, the little mini tests you know, where you have to draw a clock and all of those kinds of things. So we really start to focus in, uh, in those patients that are 60 to 65, um, where we start to actually ask questions about uh, that would tell us if, or, or at least indicate to us uh, if they were having some cognitive decline. But at any point, um, if you think that you are concerned about it, I personally send my patients to get evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will send them to, you know, one of the facilities here, um, usually one of the health sciences center where they have a memory clinics or they have people who specifically um, deal with memory issues. I think that is important that you have an evaluation by someone who specifically deals with memory because there are certain evaluations and certain tools that everybody does not use. But people, uh, a neuropsychiatrist or right. someone mm -hmm. who really deals with memory, uh, if you think at any age that you are having <laughs> memory issues that you need to have a proper and thorough evaluation. 
I agree with that fully. And, you know, so many things happen at your annual appointment with your doctor that right. sometimes these things can get overlooked or, yeah. or not brought up. And so I think it's just important. Um, that's part of what we need to advocate for too, as patients. Right. Exactly. It's so important. And, and so it may take another appointment, but make sure that you don't try to cram in a whole year's worth of stuff in that this right. it will get overlooked and fall through the cracks. Yes. So that is it. Listen, thank you so much for thank you. joining us. Let's give that information one more time. It will be in the chat, it, uh, the number that you could call and the um, website so that you could go if you're interested in being part of the study. Um, anything that you wanna say before we, before we go? Um, thank you so much for letting me come and talk about this. This is such a passion of mine and we are so proud to bring this study um, to this to the community, and we are we we are just so proud to be part of UNT and and part of this call. So uh, thank you so much for giving me time to speak about it. Thank you for taking time on your Sunday afternoon. I hope you guys learned something. I hope that this has been helpful to you. I hope it will open your eyes. Um, so that you have additional information. I hope it will calm your fears uh, so that you are not frightened, but that you will be um, given the information and the tools that you need to move forth and to take care of yourself. Wellness, you know, is so important to me. And uh, I thank you for giving us part of your life because your time is so important. And we expect to see you back here next Sunday. Not next Dr. Sunday. Dr. Johnson will be here. Dr. Johnson. Dr. O'Brien will be here. We'll have somebody else next week. <laughs> Someone from our group will be here, yes. Somebody else from their group will be here to discuss this. So thank you all again. Blessings, stay safe, protect yourself, and most of all, make sure that you take care of your person. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again. All thank right, you. guys, we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Bye.